Hello, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be talking to you today from my office at home. Uh, today, we're going to have a discussion of the use of proteomics in the search of clinical biomarkers. So this is the second part of the UWC Biomarkers module uh, recorded for this year's class 2023. I'm really indebted to Dr. Caroline Beltran, who provided uh, the initial uh, outline of this slide. I've changed it a lot over the last couple of years, but this is uh, still a, a class that she largely pioneered for us. Um, we're going to start with a brief recap of the initial lecture that we had uh, two days ago uh, on the use of, uh, on introducing the purpose of clinical biomarkers. So we want to provide some sort of diagnostic, prognostic, or treatment-oriented care. We need to make some sort of decision in that care on the basis of something we can measure. Now, ideally, this marker is something that we can measure very easily in patients, uh, easily attainable. It is adequate in sensitivity, which means if somebody has developed, let's say, uh, the very beginnings of a case of cancer, for example, that it, we would be able to detect that at, at an early stage to be able to uh, shape their treatment from an earlier point, point rather than catching it at the very last minute. Um, we would like adequate specificity. If we see this marker there, we want to be able to say with some certainty that this disease truly is there and not make a lot of mistakes about claiming things, uh, claiming someone has a, an illness when they don't. And we want clinical applicability. We want this marker to be something that we can actually use. Um, if you are able to uh, detect that someone has Alzheimer's at a very early stage only by taking their brain out of their, head, out of their skull, that's, that's not a viable marker, right? So we need something that's clinically applicable, something that we can uh, use to drive clinical decision making that we can attain relatively easily. Now there are lots of technologies used for biomarker discovery. I spend a lot of my time thinking about the metabolome, the proteome, the transcriptome, or the genome, because I'm a biotechnologist, but we should not uh, ignore the fact that there are plenty of other technologies out there to give us biomarkers. For example, we might have biomedical imagery. You can produce huge volumes of data from something like NMR or CAT scans or whatever. Um, histopathology still is the sine qua non of figuring out whether or not uh, this, this sample contains tumor cells. So um, we, we shouldn't ignore techniques like that just because we, we love systems biology. And there's plenty of stuff from physiology. What about uh, if you can measure the uh, electrical uh, signals of the heart the electro to get an electrocardiogram? What if you are able to measure the signaling in someone's brain? These are, uh, these are different ways that we could go about collecting signals that are useful as clinical biomarkers. So we don't need to be limited to just proteins, for example, or just uh, bits of RNA or whatever. Okay, so why would proteins be the direction that we would choose to go for most clinical biomarkers. If you study someone's genome, you may learn about um, you, you may learn that they have a particular tendency to develop uh, a disease, but it doesn't necessarily give you a, a stopwatch to say when that's going to come into effect. If you're measuring um, messenger RNA, if you're measuring the transcriptome. Um, that might be great, but it could be that the transcripts someone's producing are not all that indicative about the disease processes in their body, which typically are going to be mediated by proteins. On the cellular stage, the proteins are the actors in large, large part. So, for us, when we talk about proteins, we feel that we're much closer to phenotype than we would be with messenger RNA or with a genetic or genome uh, biomarkers. There are a lot of processes that lead through this. But one of the reasons why protein can be more indicative than messenger RNA is that trans transcriptional regulation has already taken place to produce the messenger RNA. Translational regulation may also be in place to cause the expression of the protein to be measurably different than what we can measure at the messenger RNA level. Just because you have a, a large messenger RNA signal now does not necessarily mean that the protein uh, concentrations are also up. They're different kinds of information. So being able to get both is very good. Furthermore, there are plenty of processes involved with proteins that may mediate the phenotype of a disease. Proteolysis may be necessary. The presence of the protein itself may not be indicative of disease, but if you chop off a certain part of that protein, now it is. So proteolysis can play a role in whether a protein is playing a function in a pathogenic process or a normal one. 
post-translational modifications are very, very important, and this is information you simply cannot get from messenger RNA or, or genome studies. If you want to understand which post-translational modifications are in place on gif different proteoforms to cause them to take, take on activity, you really must study things at the protein level, not at messenger RNA. And finally, compartmentalization. Where a protein is located in the cell can have everything to do with its, uh, with its function. To use the example of uh, a, a chlorine uh, transmembrane regulator, it may be that uh, there's plenty of it being translated, and yet if it's not folded correctly and making it to its place in, uh, the, the, cell in the cell wall, uh, in the cell membrane, that person might have cystic fibrosis, right? So the, there's lots of that protein being produced, but it's not folding correctly, and thus it's not getting to the right location. Studying that from messenger RNA or genomic levels is going to miss uh, understanding the, why this, uh, this change is pathogenic. Okay, so why is proteomics great as a biomarker discovery tool? First off, it's a post-genomic uh, technology. It's one that allows us to leverage all that information that we were able to, uh, to put together in the Human Genome Project and really see where the metal meets the road, where, where, the, where, the, where the tire hits the road for that matter. Um, these, are, these are ways that we can leverage our information from genome annotation to understand what's happening with proteins in, in the real world. Proteins respond dynamically. The localization within the body, within the cell, and over time. And these are, these are things that can allow us to understand how protein-protein interactions, how the way that these, when, when multiple proteins are interacting, uh, can, can play a role in, in phenotype as well. Every gene has a good probability of developing multiple proteoforms. Proteoforms may not be a term you're familiar with just yet, but I would, I would stress here that for a given gene, you often have multiple transcripts. Those multiple transcripts result from, from, uh, from the, the exons shuffling. As a result, you end up with different polypeptide sequences being created by these messenger RNAs. Those distinct protein sequences, in turn, can take on different functions. Um, and that can be dependent upon whether a particular post-translational modification is present or a propeptide is chopped off, that sort of thing. So there's an awful lot of information available to us at the protein level that we're simply blind to um, at, at, at a genomic level. And it might be that the phenotype you're, you're really after is really signaled by the presence of a particular proteoform. Being able to detect these differences among protein sequences is quite essential. Something that I really want everyone to capture from this lecture is that proteomic biomarker discovery is not a single experiment. We are going to talk about a discovery phase in proteomic biomarkers, and we're also going to talk about a verification and later a validation studies uh, phase. And these don't just ha you don't just pick one and jump in. You really need to have a set of, uh, of pr proteins that are putative biomarkers from unbiased discovery. You need to verify that these proteins are in fact detectable and go in the right direction. And then you can start working towards a clinical protocol to leverage that that kind of um, information. Generally speaking, you are not going to use a mass spectrometer to measure the presence of a biomarker in a patient as a way to decide whether this person needs a certain course of treatment or not. Instead, you're much more likely to do your protein measurement from a biofluid, if, if at all possible, because we don't like taking chunks of tissue out of people. Generally, more people are willing to give blood than they are to give a biopsy. Um, and we we're not going to use mass spectrometry because we want to use a, a relatively cheap and robust way uh, to measure these proteins. And typically, that's going to point us in the direction of an immunoassay. We're going to talk about that in subsequent lectures. But today we're going to talk about the unbiased discovery and targeted verification stages of this examination. Now, uh, of, of this pipeline to hopefully get you to a, a viable biomarker. I wanted to note a, uh, an inverse relationship between samples and analytes. Samples and analytes. I'm going to have a sample of some tea. Okay. When we do unbiased discovery, we are probably spending a lot of instrument time on each sample. Okay? 
As a result, this is an experimentally intensive step, one that is going to use the most expensive mass spectrometers, and it's probably going to rely on something called fractionation for letting us take a deep look into each sample, which means that we're going to be separating each sample into multiple samples for analysis on the mass spec. This is not a recipe that allows us to profile thousands of, of, of individual samples. Instead, we're probably going to be limited to tens, and if we're lucky, we're going to get over a hundred different samples into our sample, uh, into our discovery process. Okay, now on the flip side of that, the number of proteins that are likely to be of interest to us is more than a thousand, because even in a single unfractionated experiment on a, a, a contemporary tandem mass spectrometer, we can identify more than a thousand proteins from many samples. So, uh, it, now that's not true if you're dealing with blood or plasma, and I, I probably have more to say about that later, but um, for now I would say that if you're dealing with something like um, a cell line or something like solid tissue brought from a person, you can probably see a thousand proteins even without fractionation. If you're doing a relatively deep proteome, hopefully you're going to push that number up to 10,000 proteins that you can see in each sample. But that comes at the cost of throughput. The number of samples we process is low, the number of proteins we're examining is high. That relationship changes as we move to verification because the unbiased discovery process is letting us measure lots of proteins, but only a very small number of them will appear to be robustly different between our cases and our controls. And those are, those are the putative biomarkers. So at the next stage, targeted verification, we're going to create an assay not to look at 10,000 proteins, but rather to look at just those proteins that looked like the most robust differences between our, our cohorts. Okay, as a result, the number of samples we can process is hopefully going to jump up into the hundreds. Um, you're not going to be limited to a, to a hundred patient samples, rather you're going to have hundreds, maybe even a thousand, that would be lovely. Um, and the number of analytes that you're investigating will probably be maybe a hundred, but I don't think that you're going to be trying to look at a thousand putative biomarkers here. It's really going to be a relatively small number of proteins that you believe are the most reliable differences. So we start with, uh, with relatively few people, but looking at total proteomes. And at the next stage, we move to a much larger number of people, but now we're looking, we're shining the flashlight on just this relatively small number of putative biomarkers. And by the time we get to an ELISA assay, we have a much, much smaller number of, of proteins that we're going to measure. You'll frequently see biomarker panels of, say, five or six proteins, not 500. Okay, so as we move, we go from few people, more people, huge numbers of people, huge numbers of analytes, proteins, a relatively constrained set of putative biomarkers, and finally, a, a defined panel that we're going to detect in our clinical samples. All right, now in the old days of proteomics, comparative proteomics was largely carried out on 2D gels. 2D gels are really, really important, and yet they have some major handicaps that uh, have, have, have seen that the amount of 2D gel work we're doing is, is going away while the amount of mass spectrometry work we're doing is growing. So I, I wanted to start with a little historical perspective here. We can separate proteins by their isoelectric points. Isoelectric points. Now your biochemistry class might be a long time ago, but hopefully you remember that there's a particular pH at which each protein takes on neutral uh, neutrality. It's no longer charged positively or negatively. And we call that pH its isoelectric point. We can use an isoelectric focusing experiment, uh, sometimes carried out on uh, an immobilized pH gradient strip, um, to separate proteins on the basis of this, so that they continue moving in, in uh, response to the electrical field until they have become neutral and thus aren't moved by the electrical field. Okay, so this, this is called isoelectric focusing. We then apply that strip on top of a, a, a slab gel here, and we allow the proteins to migrate out of that strip and into the gel. We apply, a, a, again, an electric field to them, um, and the proteins that are, uh, are largest are going to separate from the proteins that are smallest, essentially. 
So this electrophoresis process is causing the proteins first to separate by isoelectric point, and secondly by essentially their sedimentation size, which is one, another way to say, are they big or are they small? Are they able to travel through small holes in the, in the gel, or are they uh, held back by these things? Okay, and that produces this two-dimensional um, display, essentially, of all of the proteins that are present here. Now, there are plenty of other things we can, we can talk about on this, but uh, I'll, I'll start by saying, just because you know the approximate mass and the isoelectric point of a protein, do you know its identity? The answer is not really. You can make some broad guesses, and, uh, and we certainly, um, if you've run the same type of gel many times over, you probably can say, ah, well, there's actin, and there's tubulin, and so on, other, other proteins that are present at really, really high concentrations. But there's a world of proteins here, and you can easily, in, in, in a 2D gel with silver staining, detect better than a thousand proteins this way, a thousand distinct spots here. So, um, when we look at these, we are we are able to detect some spots that are characteristically bigger or lesser than uh, than they are um, when we compare our two cohorts. So ideally, in the case of something like early detection of cancer, we're probably going to be looking for uh, proteins that appear at early stages of uh, cancer phenotype. Um, so. Ideally, this spot is clear when we're looking at it on a 2D gel of our controls, but now it's occupied by a, a, a nice distinct spot when we look at somebody with early stage cancers, early, an early stage of cancers. Um, now, that is, uh, that's fine and good. We'll still probably want to go about identifying what these spots are by cutting a spot out of the gel, subjecting it to digestion, and putting it into mass spectrometry. But um, for now, I'm going to just talk about the gel as a gel. Now, in this case, I have another technology that I'd like to introduce you to, and that is the xenograft. The xenograft. Um, much as we need information about how human cancer operates, we don't typically do experiments on our patients, right? We're, we're not going to... Um, we would not knowingly allow a person's cancer to get worse um, by giving them placebo when they thought they were getting chemotherapy, as an example, right? I mean, th these, these things are ethically awful. So, um, one of the things that we like to do in able to give us more information about human cancers is to get them out of the human and inject them into mice. So, a xenograft is a case where we've taken a few cells from a tumor in a human and injected them into a mouse. The mouse then develops a tumor, and that tumor is now something where we can experiment with it and, and understand which interactions um, help the, the mice to survive longer, um, which ones are completely ineffective, and so on. So in the, these are xenograft mice, um, a prostate cancer from humans that's been created in the mice as a xenograft. It's an androgen-sensitive one. So they've changed the, 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 the difference between these two cohorts is that some of these mice have been castrated. As a result, they're not producing these androgens to, uh, to which this uh, tumor responds. And so now we can look in some regions, like this box, and see a, a very well-preserved pattern of spots between the two. But when we look at these locations where these little circles are located, we have some markers, um, some spots that show up in a gel corresponding to the cases or to the controls that are differential between the two. We believe that these differences are where our putative biomarkers are most likely to be found. Okay, now let's talk about how proteomics is largely carried out today. We're not at a place anymore where we're producing huge numbers of spots and then later trying to figure out how does this spot, um, because this spot is different, which protein in it is causing, um, is causing the, this, this spot to appear. Instead, we're largely working from an identification-driven model of proteomics instead. So we start with a protein mixture. Maybe we have 10,000 proteins in it, because a lot of solid tissue does. We would digest that to peptides, typically, typically using trypsin. We often make use of fractionation techniques, which is to say we separate this one sample into 
15 samples or 24 samples or even 96 samples, um, depending on how, how much you're fractionating it out. Um, this is often using a, an orthogonal kind of separation technique. Um, it could be based on a gel. You, you can do something called gel CMS, for example, where you separate proteins on a 1D gel and then subject each, band, uh, each region from that uh, lane to a separate digestion and, and uh, LCMSMS technology. That's gel CMS. Or maybe you're doing a peptide separation based on strong cation, ex strong cation exchange before you sub subject those peptides to RPLC. So we have, um, we have lots of different means that we can use for this peptide fractionation step. But the thing I would have you remember is that we start with one sample and we produce multiple fractions, the data from which must be combined to tell us everything about the input sample, which means that we have multiple LCMSMS experiments corresponding to a single sample. Okay, once the peptides have been fractionated or not, um, we can then make use of liquid chromatography. Liquid chromatography um, is typically conducted using a reversed phase material and, and gradient setup that we are we're using beads that have uh, 18 carbon chains on them, which makes them really hydrophobic. Peptides stick to those pretty well, but you can compete the peptides off of that by increasing the hydrophobicity until the peptides come off. And that liquid chromatography ramp, that gradient, may last about 90 minutes or 45 minutes, depending on what kind of experiment you're doing. Um, so during this time, the peptides that are flowing out of the column are being subjected to electrospray. We're hitting them with 3,000 volts in some cases. And so these peptides um, that were in acidic solution are now taking on a positive charge as they're sprayed out. Now this lower uh, rung of, of, of activities all takes place inside the mass spec. We expect to get a high resolution measurement of the peptide ions, the precursor masses, to say which peptide ions are available from electrospray at this particular moment in time. The instrument can then use that information to decide which of these peptides haven't been seen recently and therefore need to be fragmented. So we isolate a bunch of ions of some particular peptide mass. We bounce it off of gas molecules to cause it to gain energy and fragment. These fragments are then measured in a tandem mass spectrum. Now, if you had me uh, talking to you in the proteomics unit, this is probably old hat by now, but I realize not everyone does that. So I'm trying to cover these, these basics. These, this is our, the, the series of steps we're doing on the bench starting with an intact protein sample and producing bazillions, maybe even millions, of tandem mass spectra, each of which is at least possibly um, the death cry of a peptide. It's giving us the ability to say which peptide sequence does this tandem mass spectrum represent. Now, tandem mass spectra are great, but ultimately most biologists are interested in which peptides they represent, and thus which proteins have we identified, and even more importantly, which proteins are differential. We're going to cover the differential piece in just a moment. But I'll start by saying that we use a, a, an approach called the database search engine, like tools like Sequest or Mascot, that are used to identify which peptide sequence from the database of all proteins that this uh, of all protein sequences known for this organism, which peptide is the best explanation for seeing this tandem mass spectrum? This gives us raw peptide identifications or peptide spectrum matches. Some of these peptide spectrum matches are going to be reliable, and some of them are trash. And we want to be able to separate the good ones from the bad ones. Once we've done that, we can now say these are the peptides that we've identified confidently, and these are the spectra that match to them. From that, we can then infer a set of proteins that are our best explanation for having seen these peptide sequences. Okay, but how do we go about finding differences? For this, I'm going to say just a couple words about quantitation. Um, I've done a lecture on label-free quantitation. If you'd like to uh, view that, it's on, on the YouTube channel along with everything else. All right. Let us start with spectral counting. I'm going to make a statement, and I hope that this is going to seem reasonable, 
if there's more of protein A present in a sample, we, can, we have a better chance of seeing a large number of peptides from protein A. If there's less of a protein in a sample, we have a lower chance of detecting the peptides of that protein. As a result, we typically observe fewer peptides when a protein is less concentrated. Now, we also have a chance of seeing some peptides multiple times. It could be that when a, when a protein is present at higher concentration, its peptides are present at higher concentration. And so, rather than seeing just the doubly charged variant of this peptide, we may see both its doubly charged and its triply charged variant. Or we might see the peptide in a chemically unmodified form and also in an oxidized form. This leads in aggregate to our being able to observe a larger number of spectra that are associated with the peptides of a particular protein. So this is what we call a spectral count table. It has 10 experiments, red 1 through 5 and yellow 1 through 5. These are our two cohorts. And then we have our proteins um, down, the, down the, the left edge here. So every row represents a different protein that was detected. And when we look in the cells corresponding to red 1 through 5 or yellow 1 through 5, what we're seeing is how many tandem mass spectra were observed for peptides of this protein in this experiment. As a result, you might see some proteins here have a roughly balanced um, number of spectra seen in, in both cohorts, and others are quite lopsided. That We see some proteins that are higher in red, or some proteins that are characteristically higher in yellow. That means that we, we need to be able to process these data in a way that highlights the proteins that are most differential between our cohorts. But all of this is simply based on how many spectra match to peptides of this protein. Okay? That's what these numbers represent. All right. Now, over at the right, we have something very different. This is an extracted ion chromatogram. In this case, we have multiple times at which we've conducted mass spectrometry. We've, we've looked to see which peptide ions are currently available on the mass spec. Generally speaking, there will be no signal at a particular mass value, and then suddenly we'll see this peptide starting to elute. We'll see just a tiny little bit of it in one mass spectrum, and it rapidly rises and rises up to a peak, and then it falls away again. We can look at the, era, at the area of, of, this, um, of this intensity versus time plot, and use that to, to integrate it to an area that, that gives us a, a, an estimate of the quantity of, of this peptide that's visible here. Okay, so at the, at the left, we're simply asking how many spectra were identified to peptides of this protein. At the right, we're making an assessment about quantity for individual peptides. And we're able to ask, did we see a lot of this peptide in, these cohorts, in this cohort and very little of this peptide in this other cohort? We might use that and roll that information up at the protein level to say which proteins are differential between these two on area information, on extracted ion chromatogram information, or by rolling it up by just saying how many spectra overall did we count. Those are the two major techniques of label-free quantitation. Helpfully, there are a lot of chemical methods that we can use to improve our detection of differences in clinical samples. I thought that I would introduce at least one labeled method that allows us to do this, and that is isobaric tagging. It is possible to buy reagents that have the same mass, but which fragment differently. We can use this, essentially, to mark um, which sample is contributing a given peptide. So we can multiplex together multiple samples in a single LCMSMS experiment, but that single LC-MS-MS experiment allows us to compare the intensities of peptides as from those coming from sample 1, from sample 2, from sample 3. There are even, um, I, I know that there are currently uh, TMT tags for at least 14 different samples that you can mix together in a single LC-MS-MS experiment. So you end up spending less on mass spectrometry time, but you do have to buy the reagents themselves, and sometimes they're kind of expensive. So, um, in this case, we have a, an example where there are two healthy samples, healthy one, healthy two, 
and two disease samples, disease one, disease two. We've bought a, 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 an iTrack uh, fourplex tag, which means that we have four different reagents that we can mark our samples with. So we mark healthy one with the, uh, the 114 tag. We mark healthy two with the 115 tag. We mark disease one with the 116 tag. And we mark disease two with the 117 tag. These numbers just refer to um, how they report themselves. When we look at a particular peptide spectrum match, which is to say a tandem mass spectrum that's been matched to a sequence, we have these reporter ions down here at the bottom that allow us to compare how much of this peptide was coming from each of those four input samples in this, uh, this iTrack fourplex. So that's very powerful. We're able to compare within each PSM how much each of these samples is contributing to it. Now what happens if I have a hundred samples? At that point it gets a little dip more difficult to leverage these isobaric tags for that purpose, but there are means to do it. Um, we had some experience working with that when we were dealing with, with the CPTAC project. Okay, so um, that takes us through discovery proteomics. Ideally, discovery proteomics identified thousands of proteins from bazillions of peptides, a bazillion tandem mass spectra matched to these peptides. Now, uh, we, we've, we've gone through this process of spectral counting or um, e extracted ion chromatograms or used isobaric information to tell us which proteins were most differential in our discovery experiment. So for the next stage, we want to do this verification stage. We want to be able to ask, can we back up this discovery experiment by creating a targeted assay that is more specific to just the proteins we thought were the biggest differences. Okay, for this, we're still going to deal with peptides. We're going to digest things up to deal with, pe to deal with peptides rather than proteins. We're still going to use liquid chromatography. We still separate the peptides on the basis of hydrophobicity. And we still use electrospray ionization to create the ions, the, the stream of ions coming into the mass spec. But now we're going to be doing a different kind of operation in the mass spec that allows us to get specific information about just the peptides on our list. Okay? We had a set of proteins we found to be differential from the discovery proteome. Now we're going to make a list of just those peptides we want to focus the mass spec's attention on. The mass spec, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, is able to screen out all but the target mass of the precursor ion, the peptide itself. We can then fragment that pe the, that, the ions that pass through that filter, and then we can screen out all but the fragment ions we want to monitor from this peptide. So uh, you, you can already start to think about this as a three-level thing. We have proteins that we believe are putative biomarkers. We have peptides we choose to target from those proteins. And now we have fragment ions we expect to observe for these peptide ions. All right? So we screen out all but this particular peptide, we fragment it, and then we screen out all but the particular fragment that we are sc scanning for at the moment. That allows us to create a series of traces that represent the intensity of multiple fragment ions from this peptide. And that's used for integration, which gives us a quantity for the peptide. And we can then do a balance of how this peptide's uh, intensity varies between our cohorts. This is called a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. It's not as, as, as sexy and amazing as the, you know, the, the lovely Orbitraps and Timstoff and tri uh, Tripletoff devices that we can buy uh, today. Um, it's actually much, much less expensive, but it's very, very good at quantifying just the peptides you want information about. It's a nice, cheap instrument, and they don't die, which makes them last forever. So, we have, as in all mass spectrometers, an ion source, and we have detectors, and we have mass analyzers that allow us to interact with the ions as they move through the instrument. We're using something called a quadrupole mass filter as a way to uh, screen out everything that isn't our peptide ion of interest. We have a modified um, 
quadrupole here that's being used to conduct the process of energizing the peptides by bouncing them off of gas. And we're using a quadrupole mass analyzer again, these are three different analyzers essentially, um, in order to, to isolate ions of a particular fragment for this particular peptide ion. Then the detector produces a, an electrical signal that we can measure to associate this peptide with an intensity, and with a, an area for this experiment. Okay, so what is the point of this? This is all called a Selected Reaction Monitoring, or SRM, experiment. Its whole goal is to collect chromatograms that relate to this particular list of targets that you gave it. Each target is going to be associated with a set of transitions. So I have some protein and I have three peptides, let's say, that I intend to measure for this one protein. Each of those peptides will be associated with a parent ion mass, which is to say, what is the mass of this peptide when it's in one piece, and also a set of masses that represent what fragment ions do we expect to see if this peptide is going through the mass spec right now. Okay, so what we have then is something called a transition. This is a key vocabulary term associated with selected reaction monitoring experiments. A transition is a pair of a peptide ion mass and a fragment ion mass that should come from it. Each of these results in a chromatogram that gets measured in SRM. I can feel my voice breaking up. So you might imagine that you started with 50 proteins you believed um, were putative differences between your cohorts. So that, here's our 50 proteins. We now decide these three peptides are the best ones to measure for each protein. So three peptides per protein takes us from 50 to 150 peptides, 50 proteins to 150 peptides. And for each of these peptides, we're going to measure three different fragment ions. 150 peptides become 450 transitions. As a result, the instrument is having to change all the time which transition is getting measured at any moment in time to reflect the set of peptides that are coming out right now. Okay? So scheduling is an approach that allows us to, um, to specify that this peptide, for example, has very low hydrophobicity. It's quite polar. As a result, it comes out early in chromatography. So we need to look for its transitions early, but we don't need to look for them late. When we have this list of 150 peptides, we have essentially 150 different arrival times for the party, and we need to, we need to be looking for the right person at the right time, if that makes sense. Okay, um, some popular software for dealing with data of this sort is called Skyline. Um, this is a little pixelated, and I apologize for that, but what we see at the, at the left are different proteins, here indicated by the little squiggly blue thing. Each protein is supported by peptides, which are shown by that little icon. And then each of these peptides is supported by particular transitions, uh, particular fragment ions that we would look at for that peptide. So here we see this peptide has a mass of 714.8, and it has these fragment ions that should appear at 1127 and 998 and 884. So each combination of precursor mass and fragment ion mass, a transition, is listed separately here. And the software is able to evaluate things like which peptides appear at which retention times, how variable are they across experiments, and do all sorts of useful things like that. And it's even able to show you the rise and fall of, of these transitions. Ideally, because a peptide shows up at one particular time range in chromatography, we expect all of its fragment ions to rise and fall together, not to have one fragment ion over here and another over here in retention time. It doesn't make sense. So we expect then that we should see all of the peptides rising and falling together to give us a lot of confidence that this peptide was the one we actually intended to measure. All right, here's a better depiction of that, actually. In this case, we have a particular peptide ion, and it produces Y3, Y4, Y5, Y6, and Y7 fragment ions. So here we are looking at five different fragments that we've monitored for the single peptide. 
And what we see is that here at about retention time 52 minutes, we have all of them rising and falling together. That's exactly what we want. The software is able to say the peak time for observing it is 51.8 minutes. And you can see that we've got some bounds put on this, um, these uh, dotted lines to the left and right. These indicate the range of times in which this peptide was detectable. Okay, so ideally, from this kind of information, you can get very carefully controlled coefficients of variation, which is to say that when you claim this protein is up by 20% or up by 100% or whatever, you can have a very tight uh, expectation of error on the quantitation around that. That um, if you take the standard deviation of those measurements and divide it by the mean, you get uh, th this uh, amount of variation. Uh, only 10% variation is really, really good. If you try to do quantitation from discovery experiments, yes, you can get quantities, but often the coefficient of variation associated with them is far, far higher. So one of the key lessons for this lecture, in my mind, is that if you want a quantitative result, you should really do a quantitative experiment. It's far too often the case in proteomics that people do shotgun-style experiments and hope to be able to do all their quantification from that. It's really better to have a quantitatively designed experiment if that's what you're going after. Okay, um, there's another key principle down here that occasionally another peptide ion will have a very similar retention time and a very similar mass to charge value. And that can create what's called an interference, where the chromatogram you produce for some fragment ion is really distorted because it's representing contributions from multiple peptides. Something like that it represents a chromatogram you must throw out because it, it's tainted with this crossover of information from another peptide. You don't want that. Okay, from this, it's possible to get calibration curves, which is to say that as you, have, as you create a known sample with a larger amount of some protein in it, you're able to get a larger peak area that scales up with it. Ideally, if you put three times as much of some protein in the sample, you'll get three times as much peak area out. There's some amount of variation, necessarily. And when you have a very, very small amount of a protein, it's still possible that you might detect something at the, the place where you expected its transition to be, even if that peptide is not even detectable. And conversely, if you have a huge amount of some peptide present in the sample, it might be that the peak area no longer grows linearly as you add more sample to it. So we, we need to be able to think about our limits of detection, which is to say how much of this peptide must be there before we can be sure that it's really present. What are our limits of quantitation, which is to say um, what is the minimum and maximum value for which we have a controlled CV in our, controlled, in, in our, our um, intensity measurements for this peptide. And ideally, we're doing all of our experiments in the linear response range, which is to say, if you double the amount of sample in the mass spec, the, the area also doubles. You, you want that kind of linear relationship between the two um, as, uh, as a way to ensure that you have reasonable quantitative capacity. So which strategy should I use? Should I be looking at biofluids? Should I be looking at solid tissue? Should I spend my time on a cell line? Or do I need to work in a xenograft? There are lots of technologies out there because there are lots of cases that require different, different specialties. So uh, not, there's no single technology that's always the winner. You, it, you shouldn't be one of those people who say, if you're not doing isobaric labeling, you're not doing quantitation. That's silly. It's not right. Um, nor should you be somebody who says, well, all of these technologies are, are just expensive. I always use the simplest experiment, and that's always the right way. Well, you might get none of the information you actually need from such an experiment. So asking things like, what is my sample type? If, I can, uh, if, if I'm working in uh, biopsies taken from lung, for example, you, you may not have a whole lot of flexibility about what kinds of samples um, you're working from um, in a case of something like cancer. But in, I mean, the lungs can also give us all kinds of interesting things like 
bronchial, uh, bronchiolar, alve bronchial alveolar lavage fluid, um, a, basically a, a liquid sample taken from within someone's lungs. I, personally, I'd, I'd rather have someone slurp up a bit of liquid out of my lungs than I would uh, have them cut a piece out of my lungs. So um, the, the, the sample types we're working with will have everything to do with how uh, compatible they are with mass spectrometry. And biofluids, particularly plasma and serum, have some in incredible challenges associated with them that make them quite difficult to work with for discovery proteomics or for uh, verification experiments. How many samples do I want to compare? Certainly, if you can push that number up, it's great. But the reality is, um, how much? Uh, what instruments are available to process these samples? How much money do I have to pay for it? These certainly come into play. What are the dynamic range limits for this technology? If you have a, a mass spectrometry experiment that can only show you, say, a, a 1,000 to 1 uh, uh, ratio for a protein, that's going to compress um, even more extreme differences um, down to that range. Dynamic range comes into play in another way. If, if the proteins you find interesting are ranked a thousandth and a thousandth, a thousand and one-th um, out, uh, out of the abundance of all proteins in the mixture, it's going to be really difficult for you to get solid quantitative information on that without a targeted experiment. It might be that um, our technologies are a whole lot better at spotting major protein differences rather than the stuff that's down in the grass. And that is a problem all analytical chemists have to deal with, not just the people in mass spectrometry. Okay, why is it that a biomarker discovery experiment fails? I, I should tell you this glorious thing that proteomic mass spectrometry always gives us great biomarkers that immediately become drugs and everyone is happy and humanity is safe ever after. This is not true. Proteomics has been a very difficult technology to, to map to biomarker experiments. So I'm going to try to walk through some of the reasons why. First off, dilution effects. How big is uh, an, early col uh, an early cancer tumor? Probably smaller than a pinhead. So if you have a tiny tumor, I mean a, a big one's like what, a, the size of a, a pea perhaps, a tiny tumor secretes a small amount of an unusual protein that is dissolved in a complete body's blood supply. If you want to detect a vanishingly small tumor and it's exporting just a very small amount of the protein that you're trying to spot as a biomarker, you got a problem because the dilution effects are really, nas really nasty here. A vanishingly small number of, of micrograms of protein diluted in the many, many liters of a body's of the body's fluids becomes an incredibly difficult thing to detect, especially given that body flu uh, that um, that biofluids are such a mess for uh, doing shotgun discovery experiments. So dilution effects are a big deal. If the thing is too small and it's not producing much of a signal for you to measure uh, of this biomarker you want to detect, that's a problem. Underpowered is a common common problem. If you have too few cases and too few controls included at the state of discovery, a protein that's really different may not be detected as a difference at all because it can't stand out against the, the basic variation that you see from sample to sample. If you have too few cases and controls, if you're doing three of these versus three of those, the number of times you can detect real differences falls miserably. The three-on-three -three study should die. We should not be looking at stuff like this because it's, it's frankly a waste of everybody's time. We need to have enough samples that our studies are powered to detect real differences. Dynamic range. So protein concentrations of major proteins dwarf those of minor proteins. You might need a technology called depletion to remove some of these major proteins to unmask the stuff beneath them. If you're working in, in serum or plasma, for example, there are columns you can use for pulling out fibrinogen and hemoglobin and albumin. We've got oodles of that stuff in our blood. So if you can remove those, it's possible you're going to be able to see the more interesting stuff beneath them. That's depletion. Um, and it, it helps us to resolve this dynamic range problem. Also, enrichment. It might be that you've got to do something like a pull-down with an antibody in order to be able to detect this protein that you predict is going to be a really, really good biomarker. However, any time you increase the complexity of the experiment, 
you increase its variability. So if I am using a pull-down um, from all of my cases and all of my controls, performing with the same antibody against all of these samples, it might be that my pull-down process adds 20% CV to the measurements before I even get to the mass spec. In a case like that, I have a problem because I need to be able to quantify the amount of this protein reliably if I'm going to call it differential. Okay. So, the take-home messages would be that proteomic biomarkers are valuable because they're close to the scene of the action. Proteins are frequently what's mediating phenotype. They're frequently what's doing the, the stuff that leads to disease. Therefore, looking at proteins for biomarkers is really, really good. Gel-based methods have gradually given way to liquid chromatography-based mass spectrometry. This is good and bad. It's good and bad. There are uh, a lot of aspects of mass spectrometry that are highly quantitative, and a, and a well-designed experiment can give you very, very good data to work with. Um, the reality, though, is that sometimes people can miss the forest for the trees, that there are uh, quality control problems in their data that they don't notice until too late. As a result, they end up having a lot of variability that masks what they'd like to learn from their experiment. So, gels are nice in that you get the whole picture of the proteome in one shot. You can even save a gel for, um, for long-term reference if you really want to. You can certainly save the, the photographs that you, that you take of them. But, um, in general, because people want to look deeper in proteomes, and they want to do so in this quantitative way, I think that mass spectrometry is gradually pushing 2D gels aside. While differentiation is possible in discovery experiments by both label-free and labeled approaches, we talked about spectral counts, we talked about extracted ion chromatograms, we talked about isobaric tags. These methods are all part of discovery experiments. You can, you can find differences with any of those. Targeted quantitations are much better at dropping the variability so that you have greater quantitative confidence on each peptide and on each protein. So when you want the, the quantitative result, go for the quantitative experiment. A biomarker experiment is going to start with shotgun or discovery experiments with tens of people and then transition to a targeted SRM experiment and that's going to have hundreds of people ideally. This gives us the ability to check whether the proteins that our discovery cohorts said were differential really do look uh, differential when we start looking in new people with this new assay. It's important to do this verification step if you're just doing a shotgun discovery experiment and saying these proteins are clearly the, the drivers of bio biological difference between my cohorts and you haven't done a verification experiment, you've left yourself vulnerable to an attack by a peer reviewer of your manuscript who can say, where did you confirm this in another cohort? It's a very important question, and frankly, a lot of proteomics journals will turn down your paper today now if you say, I have detected the differences and we've quantified them thus, and th this must be truth. Having the verification experiment is a way to prevent you from fooling yourself with your own data. So having both a, a, a difference detection or discovery process and a verification process can help protect you from making a silly mistake. You want your paper to be uber reliable and having both pieces of that matters quite a lot. All right, well, that's it for uh, the proteomics lecture. Um, we'll be moving in, uh, continuing on to stuff like uh, immunoassays and uh, I believe we're going to talk a little bit about Luminex along the way. Um, as we continue to talk about proteins, because people don't want to use mass specs in the clinical lab space. Often we want to have a much cheaper test that we can provide at room temperature without the needs of lugging around a million dollar experiment, right? Or a million dollar instrument. Okay, so we'll be right back um, uh, with the next lecture in the series, and I hope that this helps clarif to clarify some of the some of the, the important aspects of how mass spectrometry shows up in searching and confirming proteomic biomarkers.